Hi, everyone. This is Steve Peck. Before the show begins, I wanted to let you know we've placed a donation button on our website, DivorceSourceRadio.com. We're trying to keep this program commercial free, and your support through donations will help us do just that. Thanks in advance for your consideration. Hi, and welcome to Divorce Source Radio, your source for information related to divorce. I'm Steve Peck, and on today's program, we're inviting the host of The Smart Divorce on Divorce Source Radio, Deborah Moscovich, to join us. It's great to be online with Steve Peck. <laughs> it's it's uh, different than hosting your own show, isn't it? It's wonderful, though, because I, I, I love talking to you about divorce and the many different aspects, and you make me think. Mm-hmm. And isn't that what we need to do is just think about how we can help people? We need to think more, and that's kind of what we're doing today in the show. Uh, the title of the show is Mistakes People Make During Divorce, and we're going to talk about that. But I want to tell our listeners, a lot of them who've been listening to the Smart Divorce Radio Show, you've been on hiatus for just a little bit as we've gone through the summer, and, and you've been busy with your family, but you will be coming back with more Smart Divorce shows very soon, correct? I will be coming back with lots of Smart Divorce shows very soon. As a matter of fact, I've got a great roster of guests lined up. So tune in weekly and you will hear such fabulous guests and ideas and and concepts. And if you want to listen to some of her past shows, just visit DivorceSourceRadio.com, look through the archive, search The Smart Divorce with the one, the only, Deborah Moskovich, and you'll find all of her past shows, some really cool ones too. But let's get into mistakes we all make during the divorce process, Debbie. What I've been finding in the last few weeks is all of a sudden my phone has been ringing off the hook, which is really wonderful for me. But it made me start thinking about what's happening to people over the summer. And what I've realized is that it's slow. People are going into the summer. They really want to enjoy their time. And then come September, that's when people start thinking about the next step. It's kind of like their New Year's resolution. The mm-hmm. summer's over. You know, in New Year's, it's like, what am I going to do now that it's a new year? Mm-hmm. And people start thinking, the summer's over. Now what am I going to do? Yeah. And <laughs> Especially called- if your kids are going to college, right? Because I can remember... My son started Michigan State a few years ago, and during his freshman year, they had one of these parent meetings, and uh, they had a psychologist speak to all of us, and she said, you may not know this, but the divorce rate increases. Uh, It's the empty nest syndrome, which your kids, some of the kids go to college, then it causes people to say, now's the time, and that's what you're talking about here, I think. That's right. And it doesn't matter if it's the gray divorce, like they were talking about, you know, gray divorce is older parents. Not that everyone has gray hair. Because I certainly don't. (laughs) Or (laughs) hair at all. (laughs) (laughs) But it's true. Individuals start reassessing their life. When your son went to college, you know, that's the thing. People start reassessing, hmm, I don't know if necessarily know if this is the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with kids gone all summer, maybe the kids are at camp, you're a little bit more relaxed, you start thinking, you start researching. Come September, I think people really evaluate what's going to happen over the next nine months. And many individuals start doing their due diligence. I'm not saying that everyone's going to get a divorce. And I I really hope that people think twice before they make that decision. I always tell my divorce consulting clients, if this, is this what you really want? And as a matter of fact, lawyers, and I'm not a lawyer, but when you go to a lawyer's office, they will counsel you. It's it's part of their, it's the ethics of a lawyer to say, are you sure that this is the only route for you? And so that's one of the first mistakes that parents make is that all of a sudden they think they're not happy, but they haven't done the work that they need to do on themselves to realize whether or not divorce is the right decision for them. Why isn't their marriage working? Is it because of they're not working as a couple? Is it because of something that the individual is not happy with? Is it something that their partner is not doing that's causing them this distress? Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I do is suggest to my clients that they go for either couples counseling or for their own individual counseling. 
So that's the first mistake that we're, we're rushing too quickly to divorce when we should really be thinking more about our relationship and maybe ways to save it first. That's right. Don't you think so? I absolutely do. And, and you know, it's interesting when you talk about uh, when, when it's back to school time, how parents start to think about that. Because um, there's never a good time for divorce, but certainly as you move closer to holidays, it becomes even a worse time. So I guess this is like your last chance before you move into that phase. Right. There's never a good time about divorce, and there's never a right age to divorce. And when I say right age, people say, I'm going to wait until my kids get to college. I'm going to wait until my kids get through high school or whatever it is. Like they're waiting for different phases. And with each stage and phase in a child's life, the the way that they react to the divorce is is different. So for instance, if you have very young children, in a way, they haven't had as much family life together and they might be impacted less than a teenager. And do you know that even adult children of divorce suffer? You know, people think, well, you know, my kids are now 25, 30, doesn't really matter. But you know what? They're suffering just as much, if not more, than some little kids. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's true. You can be like, disgusting. I can't believe that mom and dad would do this (laughs) after all these years. After you put up with mom or dad for like 30 years, now you're doing this? Like, right. what happened? <laughs> or why didn't you do it earlier? Because you've been fighting for the last 25, 30, 40 years even. All I hear is fighting. And now you want peace? I wish there would have been peace when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, I, I think the best window is is from birth to about three years old. Because a lot of the kids just don't really understand what's going on. Beyond that. Yeah, you know, you've got a good point. So it kind of becomes a way of life for them. Right. And maybe if you're young enough, your children are young enough, uh, oftentimes people remarry or get into a significant relationship. So they, you will still have that family, you know, the intact family. Now, I, I really hate labels. I hate I wrote an article for the Huffington Post about the broken home is your home broken. And I couldn't believe the response I was getting from people because Mm -hmm. I I hate that label of a broken home. So just because there's two parents at home doesn't necessarily mean that their home is intact and somebody else's isn't because there aren't two parents living at home either. But I do think that when you're young enough to start over, rather than live with conflict for many years, it's something to think about. What do you prefer over broken home, just from a terminology point of view? A single parent household. Single parent. <laughs> I'm not into labels. I'm really, right. you know, like, do, do we have to say something? I, I never say to my kids, I'm a single mother or, or you know, I'm your mom. So I, I, I don't like to get into that frame of thinking. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I mean, we're all very hooked on labels and uh, broken, yeah. It does sound kind of, it sounds broke. <laughs> it just sounds broke. Yeah, and, and I have to tell you something. I think that um, I'm not perfect, believe me, and I've made lots of mistakes. But from if an outsider looked at my home, um, other than physically looked at my home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's kind of falling apart in places. But if you really looked at what went on with my kids and my relationship with my children, they'd see a pretty dynamic household full mm-hmm. of love. Mm-hmm. And if you look at some homes with two parents living at home, you know, these latch kid keys where let latch what is it, latch key kids where mm-hmm. the parents are never home or the parents were always fighting, like does that make them a more functional household than my home uh, or point. your home? Good point. No. So I think that there's so, so, no, absolutely. So I think that there are so many things that people need to think about. So first mistake is, is your marriage really over? Is this really what you want? Think about it. And how do we do that? What, of, what, are, what are the steps we take to evaluate that? I think that there's a lot of soul searching. For me, I think that I, I really help guide my clients and try to send them to a therapist be it a social worker, a psychiatrist, a a psychologist, someone who can help them think things through. Now, therapy's not for everyone. So just take the time to think things through, even looking at reading self-help books, journaling. I just find that if you take some time to think about it and think it through, 
you'll get some clarity. So however you do it, with a therapist, you know, on your own, maybe with a an advisor, like a, a, a neutral, a, a friend who can really be neutral, clergy. Clergy is a great neutral third party. Mm-hmm. Um, some kind of mentor. I don't know. Do you have any other ideas? I don't. <laughs> That's uh, That about covers it. I mean, you have to talk to somebody and work it through. You have to talk to someone. Now, one of the things that I believe about a smart divorce, and this is what I tell people all the time and I write about it, is that being happy, being smart post-divorce is hard work. A marriage is hard work. A relationship is hard work. Being a parent is hard work. Anything that is going to give you some great results is hard work. So being happy post-divorce is hard work. So don't you think it's important to take the time going through the process to make that decision to alleviate the stress of thinking of the hard work? Let me tell you, this is what I mean, because I know that that was kind of a convoluted explanation. You know, in 10 years from now, do you know how many people have said, 10 years from the divorce, I've had many people say to me, you know, I wish I would have worked hard at my marriage. If I would have known how hard divorce was, that the grass wasn't necessarily greener on the other side, I might not have made that choice to, to divorce. Oh, but if you did that work up front, then you might not have those regrets later on. So that if you knew ultimately that divorce was the only way to go, 10 years from the point of being divorced, you know, post-divorce, then you say to yourself, as bad as things got, as hard as it is, you know what? I made the right decision. And that's what I mean. You've got to do that soul searching up front so that no matter how difficult it gets, you know you've made the right decision. Can you work through any issue? <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, when you're working through a divorce, when you're evaluating, do we stay, do we go? Uh, there are some issues like an affair where for some people, I mean, that's instantly, we're not going to work through that. I can't get Good over point. that. I tell you what. When you lose trust, respect, and you have no communication, what kind of relationship is that, right? So an affair is something that will be the catalyst for many to choose to leave the marriage. On the other hand, if your partner is a little bit more open-minded and they say, what is it that I've done or what is it that we've done together that made my partner want to look outside to have the affair? So there are couples, I have to tell you, there are lots of couples that are able to move past that affair and to regain and rekindle what they had at the beginning. Like, what was it? Maybe someone was so consumed in their career that they really did, ha- they really did forget about their spouse. Or maybe as a parent, you know, and this happens for a lot of women, um, probably myself included, that, you know, when your kids are young, the kids become the focus. I mean, I, and I hear this all the time. Your kids, all you're doing is running for your children. And if you've got a job, so you're running for your kids, you're working on your career, you're probably managing the household. There's so much that you do. And at the end of the day, you have little energy left for your partner, for your spouse. So you've got a lot of, there are a lot of men out there who feel really neglected. You're shaking your head. I'm sure you've heard this before, you know, many times. And I think that if the couple sort of steps back and and looks at what went wrong and the dynamics in the relationship, maybe they're able to move past that affair. I would love to do a show with some of those people, the ones that have experienced an affair but yet found a way to make it. I find that fascinating. Isn't it? Now, there, there's a great show that we did, I don't know if you remember, with Emily Brown. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the anatomy and affair. So if our listeners today are in that situation and want to know more about affairs and explore more about affairs, I think that's a great show to listen to. Mm-hmm. The Anatomy yeah. of Affair with Emily Brown. So that's one thing. You've got to do the soul searching up front. The next thing, what are some of the mistakes? I think that people need to be more aware of their finances. How many people do you know divorce without having any clue about their finances? Oh, tons. Now, and and just a minute, forget about getting divorced. How many people are in marriages that have no clue 
about their finances. Now, I will tell you, I met with a broker a while ago, and she said to me, that's a really good that's a really good thought. She had she deals with very high net worth clients and she asked some of her clients if they really understood the finances of what was happening in the family. And eight out of the ten women she was meeting with had no idea about their finances. Now these were all happily married women. Mm-hmm. So she said to them, like, you know, this has nothing to do about divorce, but don't you think you need to know what's going on in your family? Absolutely. And and I think that that's the next step then is just not taking an interest or, you know, a care or concern about what's happening in your family fa- family finances. So, listeners, number two. Number one is the soul searching. Number two is understand your finances. Where's the money coming in? How's it going out? What are your assets? What are your liabilities? But how do you do, do that look- once you're right in the middle of divorce? I mean, you should know it before. That's what we're saying. So if you're listening very early on, I mean, you should kind of know it. I mean, sometimes one partner knows it, the other doesn't. But I find that a lot of just both don't really have that much of a clue. So if you're thrown into a divorce, then, and, and let's say you're a housewife and your husband's working. Um, now do you have to use the divorce process with your attorney to do a little investigative work to figure that out or can you just get the record yourself? Ah, no, that's a good point. So there are a few different things that you can do. Uh, if there is no financial disclosure, like if you cannot get that information from your husband or wife at all, it's going to go through the through the lawyers to get the full financial disclosure. And when you think about it, all the paperwork going back and forth between the lawyer's office to get that full financial disclosure cost you thousands. It could cost you thousands of dollars. So if you're upfront honest, look at all the money you could be saving and putting towards family finances. Now, if you don't know what the finances are and you really want to get an idea of, for instance, you're at the very beginning of the process, you want to fill out your financial statement, but there are lots of things that you can do. If you have a joint bank account, what's to stop you from going to the bank and getting photocopies of your statements? Like, just so you can understand what's coming in and going out of your bank statement. You know, a lot of couples have joint accounts. Mm -hmm. If you have joint accounts, maybe you have a joint, um, you know, a a, a broker. There's nothing stopping you from calling your broker to try to get some information. Go to your bank manager. Now, what about your phone company, your cell phone company, your heat, hydro, and all that kind of stuff? You know, maybe the files are at home. There's nothing to stop you from looking at the files. I'm not saying to be nosy, but hey, you know, you have a right to know how much it costs to run your how, how much it costs to run your home. Mm-hmm. Or if you can't find that information, why can't you call the hydro company yourself, the heat company, the phone company? Like you can make those phone calls too and get at least a rough idea of what your expenses are on a monthly basis. Right. You can even call the bank, you know, now that I'm thinking, now that I'm thinking, now you got me going, <laughs> you know, call the bank, you know, find out about your mortgage. How's your mortgage being paid? Chances are both parties, both the husband and wife's name is on the, on the deed or, mm-hmm. you know, on, on the paperwork. So you have just as much right to call the bank as your partner does to get that information. Are you paying your mortgage weekly? Are you paying it monthly? You know, all of these things make a huge difference. Yeah, except what if you haven't really addressed the divorce situation with your spouse and now you're gathering this information, you're calling the broker and, you know, the chance of the broker calling, you know, the husband and go, hey, your wife's calling for all this information. What's up? Is that going to send up red flags and put you in a, you know, very difficult situation? Possibly, right? Okay, so Steve, you're playing devil's advocate. And yes, it could put you in a very precarious position. What I would suggest is that Anyone listening to the show, you might want to talk to a lawyer about your finances and to give you some guidance to protect yourself financially. So that, for instance, let me give you an idea here of what just happened to a client of mine. They had, she had a, a joint bank account with her husband. Uh, they had a joint line of credit. And he ended up taking out more money than my client was aware of from the line of credit. Do you know that she was still responsible for that? additional uh, loan. Really? So, 
Yeah, so whereas she thought she was responsible for $10,000, she was actually responsible for $25,000. He took out an additional $15,000. So you see, if there are any kind of oh, charge cards, there's another one. So if you have two charge cards together, you've got one is the primary card holder and one is the secondary pr- card holder. Do you know what that is? Maybe I should explain that. Is The primary card holder is the one where the, the, the um, initial bill goes to, but the secondary card holder is has the the same credit card number, you know, and the bill goes to the primary card holder. Like I have that with my kids. I'm the primary card holder and they're the secondary card holder, right? So oftentimes somebody's thinking about divorce and will end up putting huge expenses on their credit cards. Like I heard someone going out and buying $20,000 worth of jewelry or having uh, quite a bit of um, plastic surgery done. You know, <laughs> you know and, and <laughs> they're preparing their bodies for the divorce. But you know what? Like there are so many things that people need to now be consciously aware of in terms of finances if they feel that someone might be wanting out of the marriage and kind of planning their exit strategy. So that would definitely be a mistake from what I know is to when you when you think you're getting a divorce to go access funds and take money out because when you get to court, that's all going to be coming back at you in aces. That's what I've heard. The judges don't like the fact that you would start draining the bank account. And tisk, tisk, tisk on you. Because you don't want to encourage people to go to court either. And as a matter of fact, that's the other mistake that people make, is that they think that this is just going to end up in court. But there are so many other alternative dispute resolutions, alternative alternatives to court that people can pursue. So if you're thinking about it, and another mistake people make is not arming themselves with as much information as possible about divorce process. So why not consider just negotiating a an agreement through your lawyers, you know, like do it amicably or do it through mediation. A lot of people like that seems to be a trend. I I find these days is that people want to mediate their own divorce and using a mediator as a neutral third party, who's going to help the couple come to um, a decision together. I mean, like you're both involved in what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. So there's mediation, there's collaborative family law. And those are lawyers, collaborative lawyers, or they're, they're especially trained in collaborative, where they, they've signed an agreement with the clients that they're not going to court. And if there breaks down in any way, then the lawyers are off the file and new lawyers are brought in. And okay, so then you're probably going to go to court. But collaborative lawyers, the mindset is they are so settlement oriented. And that's the mindset that I try to get my clients into is that they want to be settlement oriented. You don't want a battle. What happens in a battle if you go to court is that especially if you've got children, you're going to have to have this relationship with your co-parent for forever. Mm-hmm. You know, you think, well, you know, once my kids are in university, I'm not going to have much of a relationship with them. But you're going to have grandchildren. You're going to have weddings. There are always going to be opportunities for you to see your partner. So can you imagine going to court and reading these affidavits of statements that are just horrific? Mm-hmm. You know, kind of saying things that might have a, an element of truth, but really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's got an element of truth, but they, they're they really embellishing it to oh, make it yeah. sound like you're, like you're an ogre. All of a sudden, this pimple becomes, <laughs> you know, a huge tumor. So imagine then reading all this stuff in court. Your relationship is toast. Not only is your relationship toast, your relationship with the kids for one of the parents usually disintegrates a little bit in litigation versus mediation. And there's a great study. Bob Emery did a study, Dr. Robert Emery. And if you look at his website, Emery on Divorce, Mm -hmm. there's a great study on mediation versus litigation. And it shows the relationship between a parent and a child, and it's usually the father, um, in litigation versus mediation. So when the relationship is, when the divorce is litigated, a lot of the fathers don't see their children about four years after the divorce. I, th- I think those are the numbers. I, I can't really remember 100%, so that's why you got to go to the study. But the amount of time that they're spending with their children and now adult children is probably minimal compared to a parent who is litigating. So you've got to look at like all of the outcomes of the on the family. Yeah, so the huge mistake is to think that you're just going to go to trial and uh, yep. don't, you know, don't let a judge make the decision for you. 
It's never the way to go. And you know what? Once you get to trial, don't you find that with your clients, the majority of them, the outcome is really no different once a judge decides. Had they have just sat down and through mediation and worked it out themselves. That's an excellent point. That is almost always the case what's going to happen. And you know what? Like when you litigate, it's the judge is making the decision. So even though it's going to be, it could be roughly like the outcome could be roughly the same as what you mediated. Look at the thousands of dollars extra you spent to litigate. So there's a huge financial cost and a huge emotional cost. It's really emotionally taxing going to court. And again, for listeners that are thinking about going to court, you know, this is great setup for, because Steve and I, like we have not planned this out at all. This is just totally things as we're thinking about, uh, you know, as we go along. We just had a great interview with Justice Harvey Brownstone. And we talked about, and here we've got a judge encouraging our listeners to stay out of court. You've got a stranger making decisions for you. Why do you want that? Now, the other interesting thing is only less than 5% of cases go to a full-blown trial. So you can think you're going to court and you're going to have your day in court. You're going to be Perry Mason standing up there and there's going to be this aha moment. And everyone is going to see that your partner is so wrong and deserves to be fried. But you know what? That's not what happens. Usually the the judge is encouraging the couple to settle and to mediate and to settle and to work things through. So, you know, you're never really going to have that vindication that you think you're going to have. You know, that's that's the truth. And it doesn't go to a full-blown trial. So oftentimes, people settle. You know, what do they say in the shadow of the court? The shadow of the, the shadow of the... I haven't been doing these shows for the last three months. <laughs> you have to excuse me when I'm stumbling over the... Stumbling over my words. Um, but that's what they're talking about is that so many times you're so close to settling and you'll end up settling with that threat of trial above your head. There's always the threat of trial, even in my divorce. You know, we really never, or I never had any intention of going towards trial. I don't know if she did and it gets very costly. And in our case, it wouldn't have made a lot of sense, but, um, I was new to the divorce process and uh, I'm seeing all the paperwork come through from the attorneys and they plan as if they're going to trial, right? Because you get the interrogatories, you get a list of who they'll be calling in trial, even though they're not going to trial. This is just part of the due diligence of the attorneys to put together the case just in case it does. But for me that didn't know what the hell was going on, now I'm seeing all of the stuff and that took me to a whole different level of anxiety because I don't know that this is just protocol. I just see the paperwork. I hate it. The they envelopes the from the attorneys. Yeah, you know how you just kept getting the lawyer's letters? I didn't even want to open the damn things. And then I'm seeing trial list. And on the list, I'm seeing family members and, and people my ex had selected to appear in trial. And then my mind's going, what the hell are they going to be talking about? What if, you know, I, you know, you're trying to, your mind is just racing at a million miles an hour. Okay, now let me let me point something out to our listeners. So Steve here, he is just reliving this. He's been through it. He's moved on. He is so past his divorce. But yet thinking about the court system is making you so angry. So can you imagine then when you are in that court system, how angry you are? And then right. you not only you didn't even want to open up your the letters going back and forth between the lawyers, but for me, I didn't want to open up my statements. Because then it's the concern, oh, do I have enough money in the retainer? Am I going to have to write yet another check? Like, it's so costly. Do you know what I did? And that, what? I didn't open them. <laughs> <laughs> I threw them in the corner. I threw all the stuff from my attorney in the corner. Okay, I, I, so would, I, I think I was in a, a state of depression where I didn't want to, I didn't want to look. I didn't care. I didn't care what happened anymore. It was just all too much, and I wanted it to all end. And and you mentioned how emotional we can get even talking about it now. But someday we really need to address how emotional and how detrimental to our health this can be. I mean, I learned that firsthand. I've never mentioned it before on Divorce Source Radio, and our listeners don't know about my situation. You know about it. Yeah. 
But, you know, my divorce was just very intense. And nine days after the final hearing, uh, I go to the health club and I'm washing in the shower and I look at my hands and they're filled with hair. I literally lost all of my hair in nine days um, through what doctors call alopecia areata, universalis. And it's a stress-related condition. And I truthfully believe that it was the stress of that. And if that type of stress can make that type of medical condition happen, I bet it can make other things happen. And I bet you've heard of people before that have even had heart attacks or whatever during their divorce. It's that emotional. It's hugely emotional. And for me, like what you went through is hugely debilitating and destroying to your self-esteem. I went through, I had a pinched nerve. You know, I, I probably I just felt so tense in my emotions going through the divorce. But even thinking about divorce, I just was so tense that I had the wor- I, that I was in the worst pain ever. But, you know, for me, I think after about six months, I was able to move on and I could walk and I, and, and I didn't have any long-lasting, really debilitating problems. Although I do wake up in pain every day. And this is 15 years later. But nobody can see outwardly um, the effects of my pinched nerve. For you, Steve, it, it must be really hard you know, it just because you've got this reminder of what you went through in in your life. It's hard, but, you know, I think you can find blessings in all of these things. It's a checkup from the neck up where you really start to evaluate what's important to you. And yes, of course, it was a cosmetic change and I'm dealing with it. And you can't probably see over our webcam, but I'm, I'm actually growing hair again. This is very exciting. I have a little soul patch and and things are happening. So here we are a year after this whole process that now the body's starting to get back to normal and make things happen. But the whole message that we've kind of slid into here, Debbie, over talking about the mistakes people make, I think is, is so important to listeners. If you are listening to this program now and you're just entering the process of divorce, I mean you're listening to two people that have been this path that have been it in a very emotional way debbie to the point where she's doing her whole life around it with her book the smart divorce and at touching all the lives through the smart divorce and me through the radio you know trying to help other people so this is your chance to really listen to what we're saying and really understand that there are no winners in divorce. I mean, there's no point in my mind of even trying to go to trial with just but a few exceptions. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, what, I would just want to go back a little bit. One of the things that you said to me was, so do you ever think that there are times that you shouldn't consider that you should consider divorce like it's a no-brainer that this is what you have to do and i want to point out that if there's domestic violence yeah. substance abuse anything where you feel in danger that is a no-brainer and i really want to encourage people to get the help that they need so that they can be safe and feel safe cuz too many people feel insecure about leaving something that is so toxic for them Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, important. You don't want to be in in one of those situations. The question is, when did the violence start? Is it something that has been there for a while? In most cases, yes. The abuse has been there to some degree. And then you get sick and tired of it at one point or some explosive incident happens where you end up getting a divorce. But if you catch these things early on, I don't know, uh, am I too Pollyanna to think that You know, even I I just would like to think that if you love somebody, that there's a way that it could be worked out, maybe separate, maybe go to counseling, maybe, I mean, when you said substance abuse, when when we take our marital vows, we say for better or for worse, and substance abuse is a reality. It's an addiction, but some people can get cured from the addiction. So do you just throw the person out or, you know, I, I like just separating 
getting away. I mean, it's like being divorced, but you're not divorced. And I think legally, and I'm not a lawyer either, but I think you can put certain legal measures in place where you have some degree of protection if you're not divorced, but you're not living together. Do you know about that? Well, I guess there's restraining orders, but really I think at the end of the day, Steve, you make an excellent point, and that is getting the help that you need. So that if there are serious anger management issues, get that help. Look at what you're going to be doing for your children. For children to be seeing the violence at home is really consider is considered actually domestic violence on them as well. Like, can you imagine a child who is seeing a parent being beaten up by their other parent? No. Oh my God, nope. that is destructive. And in, in many in, in many instances. Because of this role model that, that they're seeing, they will become violent offenders themselves. Is that what your children, you know, is that how you want your children to be growing up to think that is normal behavior? No. You have to get so, out of that. So you have to get out of there. But Steve, you've got a great point. Like, get the help that you need. Um, what other mistakes do parents make? Now, this is another interesting point that I learned when we spoke to Joan Kelly not that long ago, Dr. Joan Kelly. Less than 5% of kids, sorry, less than 5% of parents actually sit down and have the conversation with their children that they're separating or divorcing. All right. Surprise, surprise. Now, that is such a critical conversation that parents need to have with their kids. Now, you can't always have it together. You know, there are some parents that can't sit down together and tell their children, so they should speak to them separately. But in most instances when parents have an amicable enough relationship that they can sit down and do what's in their children's best interest and talk to them, that would be fabulous for parents to, to think about to do. You know, that's one parent, one, 95% of parents are making a huge mistake. So parents that are listening to the show, let's increase that 5% of parents that don't talk to their children about divorce to 95%. Mm-hmm. You know, let's flip the statistics. You're here. Did you tell your kids uh, before the uh, before the fact that you were thinking about this and contemplating? I or- did. Now, there's certain things. There are a lot of things that I did going through my divorce which were not smart, and there were there were now in retrospect there were you know as I was writing the book The Smart Divorce, and now I've launched the Smart Divorce Resource Toolkit, and a lot of it is based on many of the mistakes that I did, but one of them that was in hindsight was uh, the the right way to go is I consulted with a psychologist who re- whose work really focused on families and she told me on the script that I needed to talk to my son about because my kids were one, three, eight, seven at the time. So, I mean, what do you tell a one-year-old? You know, what do you tell a three-year-old? But a seven-year-old, I actually sat down, you know, with the guidance of someone and I'm so glad I did that. And we talked about mommy and daddy separating. Now, most professionals will tell you that parents should sit down together and talk to their children. That wasn't the opportunity that was available to me. So I sat down and I told my son myself on my own. It was probably one of the most difficult conversations I've ever had in my whole life. And I, one that I didn't want to have. So I can understand why parents don't want to do it, but how can you not? Mm -hmm. Like if you really, really want to look at what's in the best interest of your children like what so mom's living in you know one room all of a sudden you know mom's living in one room and dad's living in another room and you know mom and dad are barely talking and get they're living in the same house and now they're not even socializing so now um you know visiting grandparents without the other parent you know parent kids are so much smarter than we give them credit for so that was my that that was um what happened with me and you know what I'm glad that I actually sat down and and talked to my son about it and it was a challenge and he had some rough times to work through and I also went to a child psychiatrist like I I believe in bringing in all these different professionals and helping me work through different you know processes and issues and everything else that's just me and I went to child psychiatrist to help me understand what behaviors were a result of divorce and what were just, you know, my kid's stage of life. And, you know, I have to tell you that a lot of it was my kid's stage of life, not because of divorce. If you really are a a parent that 
really does put your children's best interest first, you can minimize the impact of divorce on kids. That's a great point, especially if you have kids in their teens, because if you've told them about the divorce, now you may think they're acting a certain way because they're you know, against you or angry at you, when in fact they may just be acting that way because they're a teen. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. You know, I was talking to a client the other day, and he, and he said to me, oh, you know, my daughter just spends a lot of time in her bedroom alone. And I said, your daughter's spending a lot of time in her bedroom alone because she's probably BBMing her friends on her <laughs> BlackBerry, and she's on her computer doing, you know, I don't know, watching some shows. Like, I, I just know this for my kids. They're not acting out. Like, mm-hmm. if parents think that their kids are spending so much time with their co-parent at their home and they're not spending any time with you, Let's do a reality check here. Teenagers, as close a relationship as you have with your kids, their focus is on their own social relationships, not on their parents. Mm -hmm. So you have to come to that understanding. You know, my kids are away. I'll I'll tell you a funny story. Like here it is. My kids are away at overnight camp. They're both counselors and this was their summer job. and, And already they're coming home. They're not looking to spend some quality time with their mother and their father. No, no. Already they come home on Friday. Saturday, there's a camp reunion, and Monday, there's a big camp party. You know, like, they spent the whole summer with these kids, and all of a sudden, like, they're going to miss them (laughs) after two days. But they're spending, like, you know, the whole week. So they're not planning their time to spend time with mom and to spend time with dad and when they're going to see all these other people. No, no, now they're excited to come home and catch up on the last 24 hours that they didn't get to sleep over and, you know, the cabins together. So... Teenagers are fickle. You know, mm-hmm. teenagers are really self-centered. And they want to focus on their social life. And you know what? Good for them. You know, that's what they should be focusing on. And that's healthy. They shouldn't be worried about, is mom okay? And is dad okay? Right. I, I can see how we might amplify that, though, when uh, we're going through a divorce. Because it's tough when you're, as a couple, and your kids are all of a sudden now more distant to you because they've got their own life. But you've still got your spouse. But when you're new to a divorce and now you're at home alone, perhaps, and you know the kids are around, but they're not choosing to be with you, it's, you know, you're amplifying that they don't want to be with you. That's true. And you know what? And I don't want to minimize this at all. Your children are hurting just as much as you're hurting. And they might even be hurting more. I mean, their world has just been rocked. The, The rug's been pulled out from under their feet. You know, like here it's not status quo anymore. And now there's a lot of concerns, especially for teenagers. What's going to happen to my social life? What's going to happen to, you know, our finances? Where am I going to be living? Like they've got all of these concerns. Mm -hmm. And parents need to really understand too that kids are smart. And I've seen kids play one parent against the other. And so you have to be um, really cognizant of that. And I've also heard, you know, you've got these teenagers who are saying to mom, I'm going to be at dad's tonight. And they say to dad, I'm going to be at mom's tonight. <laughs> Where like, you know, they're really at a boyfriend or girlfriend's clever, house or they're doing clever. something that they know that mom doesn't want them to do or dad doesn't want them to do. So you really, <laughs> you really do have to be a little bit more in tune with what's happening with your kids. And that's where you're at a disadvantage if you don't have a relationship with your ex that you can communicate about that because that's kind of a mistake. You both think they're somewhere else and they're not and there's no checks and balance. I know. And the other thing that is um, really difficult if you don't have communication with your co-parent, as they say, um, is that if your child acts out in a way, like I was speaking to a client the other day and you know what? His daughter's 16 years old. She was caught smoking pot with friends. And the mother said to the father, it's your fault she was on your watch. But you know what? This, you know, his daughter was out with their friends and it could have happened just as easily on her watch. Mm-hmm. And, or could it just happen just as easily had they been married? You know, these are some of the things that teenagers want to do. They want to kind of experiment. And, and so the message is not it's your fault, but let's work together or you work independently. You know, you're parallel parenting, but you can't keep on putting the blame on each parent because something's happening while they should be with, when they're with you. Especially, you know, for little kids, you know, um, I remember my daughter who was five years old and she was experimenting with a friend with, with scissors and they gave each other haircuts. Okay, maybe it was a little bit to blame there. 
You know, <laughs> it was a little quiet. I was doing some baking. That was under my watch, and that I was truly guilty for. But, you know, for something for a teenager where you cannot monitor your kids 24-7, I think you really have to work really hard at co-parenting together. How about the potential mistake of giving your kids too much leeway? Because you're divorced and you don't want to discipline as you would have if you were still together. And I think that I'm a little guilty of that. I think that I give my kid more slack and don't ride him as much as I normally would have. Huge mistake. That's an excellent point. Oftentimes, um, I could say the primary parent, again, I hate to use these labels, but you know, we just sort of have to use them for explanation purposes. So the primary parent is afraid to parent their kids a little bit too much because they think that their children won't want to live with them anymore. And then the parent who is has the visitation, I hate that, but you know, the parent who has the children less time um, is afraid to discipline their kids because they're afraid that the kids aren't going to want to come and visit them as much. I hate, I don't want to say visit. The kids don't want to come and spend as much time with them anymore. But really, you know what? You're doing a big disservice to your kids. What's going to happen to the kids in the next generation? They're growing up indulged. They think the world revolves around them. They think there are no rules and guidelines. So at the end of the day, I think really what you have to do as parents, especially parents of divorce, and I try and listen, I am not perfect and I am guilty of certain things, but you really do have to set rules and, and structure and guidelines. And that's really your kid, you know, kids' best interest. Kids will push parents. So, you know, it doesn't matter if parents are married or divorced. Kids will push parents as far as they can go. Kids will push a divorced parent that much further because they know that sometimes that there's a little bit of guilt. You know, there's a little bit of hardship there and, and kids know that they can get away with it. And that's when you have to sort of pull back and say, you know what, mm-mm. Now, I, I admit, like, I'll let my kids come back a little bit later, you know, they'll break curfews or whatever, but you know what, certain things, for me, um, there is no leeway. you got to do your homework, you know, and there are a lot of parents that say to the kids, it's okay, you don't have to do your work, because as a matter of fact, a lot of kids at the beginning of di- at the divorce process, their marks fall quite dramatically, and you know what, being emotionally you know, being an emotional um, trauma, that can happen. But not two or three years post-divorce mm-hmm. to say that that's okay anymore. You've got to really focus on certain things. And, and to say that it's not okay to, you know, it's okay not to go to school. You know, I've heard that, you know, Johnny doesn't want to go to school today, so I'm going to let him stay home. What, what's that about? Right. You know? Or, uh, you know, Mary doesn't want to go visit, you know, mom today. Or, you know, dad today, she just has a headache. You know, like, what's that about? So I think that you do really do need to have some rules and structure in place. And you know what? I will tell you, I feel that your children will respect you more for it. So keep a proper level of discipline. But on the other side of that coin, don't try to buy your kids. You know, we've talked about on some of your programs before where the dad wants to buy the kid uh, the 50-inch big screen where before when they were married, they didn't have that. And the mom wouldn't, and mom and dad wouldn't allow them to have it in his room. And now he's got that and he's got the game station. And and, uh, I forget who the guest was that was talking about this, but she said the older kids are even more vulnerable because, uh, you know, dad will buy him a car or whatever if you stay with me. So don't, that's a real big mistake. That's bribery. And again, you're, you're creating these indulged kids. So that's called the Disney dad, you know, where, sorry, dads, it could be a Disney mom, I guess, too, for, um, you know, <laughs> for a mother. But you don't want to buy your kids. Like, what messages are you sending out to your children that if you do things my way, I'm going to buy you X. If you, do thing, if you don't do things my way, then you're not getting it. Or if you spend more time with me, then you're going to get Y. You're going to get that big screen TV. You're going to get that Xbox. I'm going to buy you that iPad, whatever it is. You should be doing these things the same way you would be doing them when you were married. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know and, and I remember, no, but the hard thing is if you were, you know, parents had different values. So, like, let's use the TV as, a, as, uh, as an example. You know, there are some parents that say, I don't think there's anything wrong if, you know, my kids have a TV in their room. And during the course of the marriage, the parent that said that kind of lost out on that battle and the kids didn't have a TV in their room. Yet when the divorce happened, 
kid to get TV in the room, you know, with the parent that was had that attitude that it's okay. <laughs> so it's so when parents have different values, parenting values, you know, it doesn't really matter anymore because you don't you can't influence it unless your children are in danger. Yeah. In our final few minutes, anything else? Any major mistakes we need to go over? I think the major mistakes are people need to to really think about the impact of divorce on themselves and in the family and do that introspective work first. I, I believe very strongly that there are two divorces that you're going through, the emotional divorce and the legal divorce. And really understand that in the legal divorce, it's a business transaction. It's whatever the reasons were behind the divorce don't matter. So don't expect that you're going to get more, you're going to get a windfall. If you didn't have a certain lifestyle, don't expect that you're going to have that that windfall. It's the unrealistic expectations. And on the emotional side, take the time to really work through it. And read The Smart Divorce. That'll really help you. <laughs> I want to talk to you more about that in just a second. But my big message to everyone is like, hey, uh, you know, what's the hurry? There is no hurry. Slow down. Slow the process down. There's no hurry to get divorced. If you need to separate, think it through. Take your time. Let things cool off. You like? I love that message. I think that it's a perfect message. And I actually will mention that to a lot of people too. Like, like can you imagine being told on Monday that by your partner that I'm getting a divorce and I want you to see a lawyer on Wednesday. Now the person that's like had made this announcement, they've gone through the grieving process. They've sort of figured it out. How can you all of a sudden go to the lawyer two days later and make it happen? You need some time to process it. And I urge the listeners who are kind of blindsiding their partner with the decision to give their partner a little bit of time to adapt to this new reality. Mm Mm-hmm. The, the, the saying the divorce can only go as fast as the slowest person that kind of applies here absolutely I think that quote's in my book <laughs> I guess everybody uses that quote information is knowledge and knowledge is power you know I guess the same cliches work mm-hmm. well most of our listeners know who you are from your smart divorce show here but for those who don't Deborah Moscovich is a divorce consultant and a divorce consultant is someone that can help you through your divorce um and and why don't you briefly in a thumbnail or on our last couple of minutes here explain what it is you do and how listeners can get in touch with you because i really think that it's important if you're in the new process of a divorce uh, to talk to someone like deborah to help avoid making mistakes that you can make. Now, Deborah's based out of Toronto, Canada, but it matters not. She deals with people all over the country. Yeah, all across North America. Divorce is a process, and that's what I want people to see it as, not a crisis. And you need to arm yourself with as much information as possible. So we talked about so many different things in the show. We talked about the financial aspects of divorce and putting your children best interest first and the dispute resolutions. Those are all the issues that we talk about in my consulting service. And so in an hour, we can cover all the the aspects of divorce. I can save you thousands of dollars by preparing you properly to go see all the different professionals. I mean, isn't it great to go see a lawyer being prepared and understanding a process rather than spending a few hours getting in that information? At least you'll know the questions to ask. Oh, heck yeah. And I mean, that's no BS, people. I mean, I, this is like a guarantee. I mean, you can actually guarantee with the smart divorce that if people call you and listen to your information, it's not going to cost them. They're going to save thousands of dollars they're going to save fact. time you know as as the subtitle of my book says save time money and your sanity but the other thing is there's a lot of people that are so afraid they don't know how to work with the lawyer they don't know of the different resources like a parenting coordinator or um you know a financial planner there's so many resources available to you and i will refer my clients to resources across north america that are going to help them through the process and now people will say well deborah it costs so much money but it also costs a lot of money to make mistakes and we can talk about different ways to use the individuals or to just use the learning so that it'll help you through the process more effectively you know at the end of the day everybody wants a smart divorce where they learn you know divorce is rich in opportunity to learn and grow from and that's what you want like you know steve like i look at you and and you went through a horrible time and i went through a really difficult time too but you know at the end of the day um we're happy you know and that's what you want like you know 10 years i'm i've been out uh, 
divorced for 15 years. And I have to say that I'm leading a great life. You know, I don't look back with regrets. And and I think that that's what you want, you know, so that even if you make some kind of mistakes, it's learning to live with those mistakes that you've made. And, and I really try to help educate my clients. Information is knowledge and knowledge is power. <laughs> that's a lot of our show intro there. You know? <laughs> but it's all true. It's all good. And your website is thesmartdivorce.com. That's right. So if anyone wants to contact me, email info at thesmartdivorce.com or feel free to call my office, 905-695-0270. Call her. You're going to save money. I mean, really, that's that's the bottom line. I wish I would have called you. I wish I would have known you were there when I was going through my divorce. Oh. But many people, that's what many people have said. And I have to say that for me, it's um, it's really gratifying being able to help people through their divorce. Oh, heck yeah. I love yeah. it. It's a passion. It's a passion. And it's a passion being on this show. It's a passion to have the smart divorce on Divorce Source Radio, just educating people about the process. You know, divorce is so much more than just that separation agreement. Mm-hmm. Your file is closed. Your lawyer moves on to the next file. But you're living with so much. You're living a life of, you know, reconfiguring, rethinking, you know, um, what does life mean as a single person now versus you know being a married couple? What does li- what does life mean as a as a single parent versus being you know two parents at home? You know the co-parenting relationship is so much. How do you create a happy and fulfilling life? Like you know, there's so much to do. Mm-hmm. And I actually look at divorce today and and you know where I was and I think to myself, I have really been able to take control of my life and develop something that's like fabulous. Yeah. You know, and that's really what I want people to do is say. You know, right now, when you're in the thick of things, and I know that you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, the forest through the trees, and all those other cliches, and it looks really hopeless, but I will tell you that if you do the homework and you do the work, you will get through it. You know, but you've got to do that emotional work yourself. Nobody can do it for you. And there you have it. (laughs) Debbie and I hate labels, but we love cliches. (laughs) They're the best. Hey, Deborah, thanks so much for doing the show with us. I know our listeners will have benefited greatly. And we're all looking forward to your next show on The Smart Divorce right here on DivorceSourceRadio.com. And listeners, if you want to find out when the new programs come out by Debbie, you can simply go to Twitter and follow us. Our follow word is Divorce Source. And if you'd like to write us an email, you can reach us at Divorce Source Radio at gmail.com. Thanks again, Deborah. I'll talk to you next time on your show. Pleasure.